Hello and welcome to The Progress Theory, where we discuss scientific principles for optimising human performance. I am Dr. Phil Price, and on today's episode, we are joined by the Gaines Fairy himself, Dr. Pack, strength coach, researcher, and university lecturer at Southampton Solon. Now, when we're training for strength and endurance simultaneously, we don't want to be training too much that we create an unrecoverable amount of fatigue. We don't want to be doing those junk running miles or those unnecessary work sets. We want to be training just enough that it improves performance, but doesn't create too much fatigue to affect our other training. But where is this limit? How do we know if we're training too much? Well, that is where Dr. Pat comes in, as in this episode, we're going to be discussing the minimum dose effect for strength training. As always, follow The Progress Theory on Instagram, YouTube, and head to our website, theprogresstheory.com. Check out all of our other episodes. Here is Dr. Pack. Pack, how are we? Hello, we're great. Uh, thank you for having me on. I'm very excited to be here. No, thank you for coming on to The Progress Theory. Uh, you're topic of re research is really quite important for this season like we're really looking at concurrent training and how you can uh, train for strength and endurance at the same time simultaneously uh, so your research areas of the minimum dose effect when it comes to strength training is really quite important because clearly if you want to try and improve strength and endurance at the same time you can't take like a triathletes program and then a powerlifters program and just add them together clearly you've got to make some adjustments so trying to find the minimum amount you need to do to show improvements without gaining such huge amounts of fatigue is really quite important so really good to have you on the show um do you want to talk a little bit about yourself and like introduce yourself to the to the listeners sure um my name is pack i am uh, located in Southampton, UK, and uh, do some part-time teaching at Solon University. Uh, at the same time, I am a strong, uh, strongerbyscience.com coach, where I work with uh, powerlifters, uh, recreationally active individuals, physique athletes, and people that want to get bigger, stronger, leaner, um, as well as you know, improve their athletic performance sometimes. Um, and I did my PhD here at Solon University in Southampton, where I looked at the minimum effective training dose required for one repetition maximum strength in powerlifters, um, which essentially was, what's the least a powerlifter can do and still get meaningfully stronger? And albeit, albeit um, assume that the audience of this uh, podcast is not strictly you know, powerlifters and strength athletes, the, the findings from, from the studies that we did as part of the, the PhD, um, I think, have some practical implications for people that are, you know, seriously uh, active and engage in resistance training and want to just train with much less than they usually do, but still get meaningful, potentially not optimal, but still meaningful uh, increases in strength. Yeah, certainly. And you're a, you're a powerlifter yourself, right? I've seen quite a few Instagram videos of you lifting some heavy tin. Uh, I, I am I'm a lifter. So I've, I've done some power lifting, but I enjoy, I just enjoy lifting. So at the moment I'm doing, uh, I'm doing a bunch of uh, hypertrophy oriented uh, work. And on top of that, some strength work, but I also enjoy going for uh, long walks and being physically active mm. in general. So I don't, I'm not your, uh, I don't identify uh, strictly as a power lifter, but I've done a couple of power lifting competitions in the past. Yeah. So a much more broad approach to just getting stronger. Not necessarily, I want to yes. get power lifted. I just want to generally get stronger and improve in many different aspects. Yeah, exactly. Love my sets of uh, 8 to 12, love my sets of 5, mm. the occasional singles here and there. But uh, yeah, it's not just uh, my training is not focused strictly around squat, bench, and deadlift strength, mm. which is what a power lift would do. And that's me. Yeah. What led you to your research on the minimum dose effects? What interested you into that area? Because I'm assuming most people find a question within their own area of expertise so if you're you know you're training you're coaching that's when the questions sort of start to come about so did was there like a particular event or something that happened that led you towards that area of research it was it was actually quite random because i am not somebody who enjoys training in the gym uh staying staying in the gym for 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 just a bit of time. I enjoy being in the gym as much as possible, as much as I can handle, at least on most days. But uh, we, 
back in the day, so in 2017, I used to, I live in the UK, but I am originally from Greece. So when I would travel back to Greece, I would train at an Olympic uh, weightlifting uh, hall with uh, a, a team, uh, with a powerlifting team. So um, that team was coached by somebody who, who later became a friend and included people that I knew personally. So we had this this, this group of 10 to, to 15 people just training all together under the supervision of a coach in a relatively controlled environment. And the coach and I thought, you know, I had just started um, uh, diving into the world of, you know, doing research and I had just started teaching. Um, and we thought, hey, it would be great to use this this opportunity that we have, you know, power lifters, they're ready to take, uh, to, to, to be guided by the coach uh, in a controlled environment, blah, 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 uh, and do a research project. And one idea we had is, let's see, they were preparing for a competition at the time. And we thought, okay, let's see, uh, let's have one, let's split them into two groups, have one group do a normal sort of powerlifting program, but just standardized for everybody. And then have the other group just do the least they can possibly do and uh, see whether they will make any progress. And that's what gave birth to the PhD then. That study is one of the studies of the PhD and is uh, available uh, if anybody wants to read it. Um, and yeah, that's that's how I thought, okay, uh, I'm not sure if you had a similar experience, but as a, as somebody who you know trains and is a practitioner, you we, some, we sometimes assume that, ah, oh, there's probably a, a good amount of evidence for this concept and that concept because, you know, it's something that we take uh, as common knowledge when in reality is common belief. So I thought, okay, let's Let's have a look at the literature and see what's the least somebody can do and still get stronger. And someone uh, being, you know, a strength athlete or somebody with with training experience. And to my surprise, there wasn't much there. I mean, there wasn't much for powerlifting in general. And I thought, okay, um, we've always looked at what's the optimal, or we're trying to always find the optimal amount of, you know, um, training volume and training work to get as strong as possible. But I thought, okay, why not also... Um, kind of draw that line, even if that line is is not just just a straight a straight cutoff point, but rather like a, a continuum, and um, see what's the least somebody who's quite strong and, and quite advanced can do and still get meaningfully stronger. Mm. No, that's really fascinating. So, what in that particular study mm -hmm. with the the group that just did whatever they could what was the minimum they went for what kind of things were they doing to the point where they decided you know that's enough like what was it about the program that they performed it and then go and you know what i don't think i need to go any further what were the parameters of that particular group in that study so we we had said some 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 like it wasn't all depending on on their you know judgment we had said they were training three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, day one, day two, day three. And they, all they did, so they did squat and bench press on Monday, uh, deadlift and bench press on Wednesday, squat and bench press on um, Friday. So they squatted twice a week, bench three times a week, deadlifted once a week. And all they did was they worked up to a heavy single to one set of one repetition at an RP, uh, so at, um, at an RP based on repetitions in reserve of nine to nine point five, meaning they loaded up a weight that was heavy enough for them to do a heavy single repetition to to a point where they could potentially maybe squeeze out another rep, or if they didn't have another rep in the tank, they could potentially squeeze a bit more, you know, a bit more load. Mm. They didn't mm. obviously they didn't attempt that; they they called it there, but that's all they did. They didn't do anything else. So. In terms of total working reps, if we exclude the warm-ups, they were doing two reps per week for the squad, uh, one rep per week for the deadlift, and three reps per week for the bench press. Three heavy mm -hmm. reps, obviously. And there that was, that was uh, the warm-ups that, that uh, amounted to that. And what we saw is because we tested at competition, so they competed at a national level competition, um, I think... Uh, two out of five participants from that group. So this was a pilot study, right? And small sample size, power lifters, very difficult population, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw that at competition, two increased their strength. We didn't, up, we didn't use inferential statistics because of the extremely small sample size. Uh, they increased their strength by, I think, 15 to 25 kilos overall. 
and the others uh, either maintained or slightly decreased strength. But during their training, around the five to seven week mark, they were all hitting all time PRs while just training with that. that, that uh, so almost all participants had to increase their total by, I think, 15 to 25 kilos within training at around the five to seven week mark. The, the study lasted 10 weeks. Um, so we, that gave us a bit of a nudge and, and, you know, obviously not conclusive evidence by, by no means pilot study, but, but it just hinted that, hey, look, these, these participants that were trained were able to still make some progress, albeit, you know, in a cloudy sort of environment because of, of, of uh, the sample, et cetera, um, just by doing a single rep. So that, that, that then sparked the rest of the project. Uh, and and just mm. gave us that hint that hey maybe you can make uh, meaningful progress just by doing much little much less much little <laughs> PhD. So that that group that didn't do the minimal dose, uh, they still improved, saw great improvements, but it was around the five to seven week when they started to go down. That's really quite interesting. Is it like an accumulative fatigue of the the seven weeks prior to that? Uh, do you think that made their performance start to decrease and the fact that the minimal dose effect group, they didn't have all of that uh, fatigue that's accumulated from the previous weeks. That's the reason why they continued to improve over the 10 weeks rather than start to decrease or plateau? I might have uh, uh, confused you a bit. So the group that did the minimum dose did really well up to the five to seven week mark. And when they competed, um, but obviously competing has its limitations, a different environment, attempt selection, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. They, they did really well within training, did okay at, in competition. The group that did the traditional powerlifting program did fine. So okay. the, yeah, so the, the, the conclusion of that pilot study was that, hey, you may be able to make uh, meaningful strength increases by doing much uh, much less than you originally thought. We need more data, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but the group uh, that did the traditional powerlifting uh, training uh, did fine. So it, it, we said that, hey, it's uh, potentially a bit risky to go that low in terms of training volume when you're preparing for competition. Mm -hmm. But then we followed up with a few studies um, to kind of explore that topic a bit more. Yeah, that was actually going to be my next question. It'll be interesting to see where it went from then. What what did you find from that particular pilot that made you go in a certain direction for your next studies? Mm -hmm. So, obviously, the in terms of ecological validity, training with one you know one to three repetitions per week is not something that many people do. At least. So, so low, like because hmm. they didn't have any accessory movements, they didn't have any back offsets. It was just a single. So we thought, okay, we pushed, we pushed uh, training volume as low as as anybody would, uh, or very close to that. So then the next step was to let's see what the literature has to say. What do we currently know about you know the concept of what's the least one can do and still get stronger? And um, we performed a systematic review and meta analysis and found. Um, so our inclusion criteria was set for studies that used resistance trained individuals, um, studies that included a one repetition maximum strength test on the squat, bench press, or deadlift with one of those lifts, at least one of those lifts being trained in the training intervention that they used. And we found that in using 70 to 85% of one RM for one set of uh, six to 12 repetitions per week performed two to three times per week. Uh, close uh, to, to muscular failure uh, or reaching muscular failure for eight to 12 weeks uh, can produce statistically significant yet potentially suboptimal strength increases in resistance trained men. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't any literature on women, uh, but there's no real reason on why this wouldn't apply to women as well. So a single set performed two to three times per week, uh, close to failure, eight, uh, six to 12 reps, can be enough for you to get meaningfully stronger um, and potentially not get as strong as humanly possible, but still to, to, to a degree where it would be regarded as at least statistically significant. What we did then is, uh, after we saw that, okay, the, the literature was still quite limited. That, that was only um, six studies that made our inclusion criteria. Um, and because my PhD was on powerlifters, I then had to take the findings from the initial pilot study the findings from the systematic review, so from what the literature had to, to say, and then do a few more studies. So what we did was this. 
And this is published as a as a multi-experiment paper. You can find it if you just type minimum dose dot training on your browser as a, as a URL. It will take you directly to the journal where the, the article is. It's, it's mm. open access, so it's all available for free. So we did five studies, and they're all published as one paper, where we did the, the following. One, study one was we spoke with uh, elite powerlifting athletes and uh, very experienced powerlifting coaches and talk to them about, we interviewed them about the, the concept. Uh, I'm not going to go into extreme detail because we'll be here for three hours, but essentially the most common themes uh, that, that came out of those interviews were that uh, a few um, heavy sets per week are around one to five repetitions would be enough to get somebody uh, meaningfully stronger. And uh, that came from, you know, world record holders and coaches who had worked with uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, individuals, uh, thousands of individuals, actually, including, again, multiple world, world record holders and first place finishers at high level uh, competitions. Um, as part of study one, we also put out a survey and uh, we, sorry, actually, that was as part of study two. Study two, um, because we were aware that when doing training studies with powerlifters, we were probably going to face the same issue as we faced with the pilot study, the issue of not being able to recruit enough participants. And what we did is we asked uh, in interviews, again, those the same powerlifting coaches and athletes, uh, as well as put out a survey to everyone, and uh, to powerlifters and powerlifting coaches of all levels and experience, and asked what they regard as a meaningful strength increase over the period of six weeks because six weeks was going to be the, the the length of the studies that we were going to do with actual powerlifters doing a program. Um, so that's a minor parenthesis, uh, because we wanted to be able to do, um, to statistically, to, to adopt a statistical analysis approach that would be more appropriate than just using inferential statistics. Okay, so then study three and study four, we actually got powerlifters, and they, we made them follow the, these the following protocols. So study one, uh, study study three, so the first study of the two intervention studies, it's a lot of uh, studies and a lot of information packed, but I'll, I'll break it down as simple as possible. Um, two groups, one group did the exact same thing as the pilot study, so just single repetitions, uh, no back of sets, no accessories, no nothing. The other group did the same thing, plus two sets of three, uh, at 80% of whatever load they managed to hit for their top single. So exactly the same program, just added two triples after their top set, uh, two relatively easy triples. And what we found was um, that using the, the data that we had from the coaches and the athletes to define what, what meaningful is, the group that um, did just the singles, they had, and let me just uh, get the results. So... They had a probability of 6.3% of achieving strength increases in their total strength that would be regarded uh, more, uh, that, that would be over what the coaches and athletes regard as meaningful, and a 13.3% of uh, achieving strength increases that would be within what the athletes and coaches regard as meaningful. That's just the singles, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know the the, the probabilities. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, where six point three percent of something greater, thirteen percent of something that would be within what they regard as meaningful. But the group that did the back of sets, so the group that just added two triples after the singles, had a ninety nine point six probability of experiencing uh, strength increases that were greater than what the coaches and the athletes regarded as meaningful. So wow. they had a really, really, really high chance of making. Uh, uh, solid gains. So that's study three. Study four, we then took the group that did the back of sets, um, and we, we had another group that did the back of sets versus a group that did just uh, an AMRAP set uh, at 70% of their one RM. So a different sort of minimum dose design where they were doing um, just a lot of repetitions, but one set, just to try and mimic the findings of the systematic review. And um, what we found was that the AMRAP group had a 41% Point one point four percent probability of gaining uh, more strength than what the coaches and the athletes regard as meaningful, um, whereas the, the back of group again had a ninety eight percent 
probability of achieving increases greater uh, than what the athletes and coaches regard as meaningful. Mm. So essentially the group that did heavy single repetitions, um, you know, worked up to a heavy single, did the heavy single, took 80% of whatever they lifted for that single and do, did two, two easy, easier uh, sets of three. That group seemed to improve, um, the, did the best long code in uh, mm. the six weeks. And last but not least, we followed with a survey study where we asked um, uh, powerlifters that competed at a high level to tell us, to give us more information about their, uh, if they had experimented with a minimum effective dose approach, uh, if not, why not? And uh, the interesting thing was uh, a lot of athletes said they hadn't and they had not done so because there was not, not enough evidence around a minimum dose approach and that they would be happy to experiment with a minimum dose approach if there is more evidence, which was cool. So the conclusion of all these studies together um, and essentially the whole project was that powerlifting athletes looking to train with a minimum dose approach can do so by performing three to six working sets of one to five repetitions per week uh, with these sets spread across one to three sessions per week per lift using loads around 80%, uh, above, sorry, 80% one RM at an RPE of 7.5 to 9.5 for six to 12 weeks and expect to gain strength. Um, but I would oh, say nice. that the findings of the, sorry, last, last sentence, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> the findings of the systematic review um, with a, you know, one set two to three times per week, six to 12 reps, near failure. Um, those apply to your recreationally active individual who may be listening to this podcast and may think, okay, I want to combine my training with, you know, I want to do a triathlon prep or I want to do uh, whatever. I want to start running and I want to lift. You can do a few uh, hard sets per week and still maintain and possibly significantly increase your strength. Mm. That's really comprehensive. That was, that was really cool. What, what is it about the, You've got the three examples there. You've got the just going to a single. You've then got going to a single, but then doing two to three back off sets that are relatively easy, but, you know, they're like sets of two or three. And then you've got going to a single and then having one other set, which is at a similar weight to the easy back off sets, but you're doing it to failure, so as many reps as possible. And it seems to be that middle one, that uh, heavy rep, and then go down to do some... Um, back offsets that seems to be the one that is has the greatest po- probability of increasing strength what is it about that one is it because those you're stimulating the neuros- neuromuscular system enough uh, by going heavy and then you've still got additional uh, sets to continue to stimulate the neuromuscular system so that's the reason why it's better than just going to a heavy rep on its own and then is it avoiding the levels of fatigue that you would get from having an AMRAP set afterwards? Is that why that one has the best probability or am I am I not on the right lines? No, for sure. One minor note, the, the group that did the AMRAP set, they just did the one AMRAP set. They didn't do a single before. Oh, they I just see. loaded up 70%. Yeah, sorry, I confused um, you with the 70%. It was 70% of the one repetition maximum uh, value that they had gotten at the pre-testing session before the mm. intervention. My bad. Okay. Um, I can see why that was confusing. There's a um, lot of numbers thrown out, so I'm just trying to no, no, make sure I'm sure. getting it right. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, I always run into the, the same the same issue and then got ADHD on top of it uh, to make it even more like, okay, here, throwing, throwing uh, a bunch of numbers. Uh, but so, yes, I would say that the why I think that the group that did the, the singles and backups improved most is because when we talk about one repetition maximum strength, we're talking about a strength that is assessed by a specific test, which is the one repetition maximum strength test. So I think that because they were practicing the test, so they were doing very heavy singles continuously for a period of six weeks. So they were getting used to the, essentially the test that they would then uh, be tested on. Um, and they were following by extra work close to, uh, you know, also relatively specific to the test because, you know, the sets of three are still, you know, low, low. Re- they could be also viewed as three singles depending on how one's, one performs them. Um, 
And I think that that's why they improved more. So they did enough to practice for the test, but then they had the additional practice on top of that. But um, it may also be that the increases they saw, uh, and that, that was a limitation, uh, were because none of the participants had been training with such a such an approach before. So shifting from a higher volume training program or, you know, lifting lighter weights, not light, but lighter than, you know, single repetitions at RP9 to 9.5. And sort of that allowed them to peak their strength within those six weeks and, you know, kind of realize all the strength that they had built up with their previous training. Would you recommend that, say I'm a novice powerlifter, Maybe I should start with the the AMRAP sets at seventy percent. Do that for a few weeks, and then move on to the uh, other protocol where you've got a higher load at around nine RPE with back offsets. Do, does that offer quite a nice progression? Um, I, w- I would say that take take. So our, our research is very exploratory, and uh, it, its goal was to promote the concept of the minimum dose, the idea that hey you can potentially make gains with uh, less uh, less work if you're in a situation where you need to do so. But for a, be- for a beginner, I would say that uh, then that comes now from my coaching self, not the, the research self. Uh, I would say that it, it, it's probably best that they do dedicate some time performing higher volume uh, training, not, you know, balls to wall for the, the, the lack of a better term. Uh, but build a muscular base and build uh, their, their their skills by just practicing and just by doing uh, a bit more than just using the minimum dose but if they if they they are somebody so if you're a powerlifter or somebody who engages in strength training and you haven't touched heavy weights uh, recently like really heavy weights it may be uh, better to adopt uh, either the 70% AMRAP um, sort of approach. It, it doesn't need to be 70. It could be 75. It could be, you know, something something along those lines or the an approach similar to what the systematic review found and do, you know, a few high rep sets, 6 to 12 reps, um, uh, instead of jumping to heavy singles. So if you haven't touched a heavyweight in a while, it may not be the best idea because um that that's a skill by itself mm. is it common within powerlifting for people to increase their volume is it quite common for people to do too much and hence why this research is really necessary yeah um, anecdotally uh, anecdotally speaking uh yes i think there is a because powerlifting is a hobby sport, so um, you know, aside from the few elite level athletes that get indirectly paid by you know sponsorships or by other ventures that they've based on their strength, it's not a sport that you go into and, and make, make a living off. So um, uh, people will sometimes. I mean, I guess it would work even if it was paid, but uh, people are keen to do as much as they can. Uh, to get as as, uh, as as strong as possible, and because of the lack of evidence around, you know, the minimum dose, which hopefully we, we've helped with a bit. Um, well, that's what we saw from the survey. People were hesitant to take a step back, and they 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 thought that oh, okay, we need to do more and more and more, and that more is always better. Mm-hmm. Um, high volume training is uh, a, a necessary necessary sort of part of the process, but how that will look. What that will look like might be quite in, in individual and, and will depend on other factors as well. Um, but I would say that we did go, or we are still going through a phase where it was volume, 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 uh, which is not not bad, but you always have to um, zoom out and understand the limitations that one might have and that it's not the only way forward. Mm. I like the way how you pose uh, volume because when you were talking about the strategy with the the high reps and the back offsets you talked about it as practice and you're trying to practice the skill and the fact that you've got different loads then changes the skill and how you're meant to move them um, and I think it's quite a good way of posing it purely because if you're practicing the skill and then you do too much practicing so too much volume then the skill breaks down so it's almost like a way of 
monitoring how much volume you should be doing because as soon as you're doing too much volume where the skill breaks down is then you're not learning the skill mm -hmm. so it's yeah quite interesting way of, of posing it i think uh, if uh, because i know that you're the theme of um this season if i if i'm not mm -hmm. mistaken it, it is as you said concurrent training um I, I can give a few examples of clients uh, that I that I've worked with that were yeah, uh, also picking up, you know, triathlon training and, and running and and boxing, and that's where the minimum dose came in handy. So, um, again, this is a concept. I always when I post a post about our research, I write minimum dose and then trademark as a joke. This is not a, a protocol like a specific you know way to train. Yeah. It's 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 the idea that hey, you could do less and still get stronger. And maintain and, and increase your strength um, while doing, you know, potentially other stuff. So, before I, I, say, I give the examples, just you can take that and adjust adjust it to your needs and your preferences. So don't feel like you have to do exactly what the studies found. Um, so I've had a, a few clients, one in particular who started triathlon training and obviously uh, did not uh, want to uh, lose strength and at the same time wanted to potentially increase strength while embarking on this new athletic uh, journey. Um, and implementing a minimum dose approach allowed us to take his mind off of the, the idea that ah, I will lose strength and I won't be able to, I'll lose my gains and I won't be able to progress, allow him to still go in the gym a few times per week and have productive but short sessions as well uh, that were enough to keep him strong and, and get him uh, stronger but without adding too much fatigue, especially because she was doing a bunch of uh, training on top. And um, in addition to him maintaining strength and, uh, well, increasing strength, the, the psychological benefit of not feeling like he wasn't losing progress was then transferring nicely to his uh, triathlon training. And that has uh, come in handy with other with other clients too, where they they've figured out that ah, I want to intensify my rugby training session. I, I won't be able to make four sessions a week, and I won't be able to do the two hours that we're currently doing. Is this the end of you know my strength gains? And and the answer was no. We can re re decrease the sessions to two to three times per week. Uh, have a rough guideline of what you will do depending on how you feel. So work up to either a heavy single or a couple of top sets and that's been enough for them to still make progress, still feel like they're uh, getting stronger and that they're not losing all the work they put in, but at the same time, focus on um, their aerobic or sport-specific training. Um, and a slight, slight note, in addition to concurrent training, for periods where your time is limited or your recovery resources are limited, maybe because you started a new job or had a, you know, a kid uh, or whatever, being able to say, cool, instead of forcing the volume and forcing the super long sessions and trying to do more than I humanly, than I, than I possibly can, um, I will just take a step back, do a few hard sets per week and take it from there. Do you have any principles that you'd recommend people to follow when developing the strength side if they're also training for something like a triathlon? If they did want to lose that strength or they still wanted to progress, what kind of recommendations or principles would you say are the, are the key things to follow if they're creating their own program? Mm -hmm. So for, for a triathlon training, I would say that because you, you do have um, – your lower body will be involved quite a bit. I mean, your mm -hmm. whole body will be, but if you um, – yeah, because you, you you may not be able to do as much work as you were previously doing for you know your your lower body. Um, taking a step, potentially a bigger step back there, uh, might be one way to to approach this. So still keeping your upper body work not not high, but potentially more than the the lower body. But I would say that starting a, a st starting point of uh, two uh, two to three sessions uh, per week with two to three uh, top sets or hard sets for each of the lifts uh, that you want to maintain strength on. Uh, and potentially, you know, th those lifts could represent your the muscle groups that you want to also maintain size on. So let's say you're a triathlete or somebody who's starting a triathlon, you could do um, two hard sets per week on your squats, uh, potentially with one or two 
back of sets, those those sets could be anywhere from six to 12 repetitions close to failure. Um, that's something that you need to adjust and see how you feel based on soreness. But I would say two, um, two to three sets per week uh, close to muscular failure, potentially avoiding going to you know absolute your absolute limit. Um, and I would try and find exercises that are as that have a low impact on your overall triathlon training. So seeing how sore you are after performing squats, if those squats are taking too much away from your um, you know running and from your cycling, it, it may be worth to either give a different exercise a try or drop the dose um, a bit more. Um, but yeah, as rough guidelines, I would say start at two to three sets per week, uh, mm. split in two to three sessions for uh, the lifts that you want to maintain, uh, see how you're responding, how the rest of your training is going and take it from there. So very auto regulated, just see how you respond, start low and then go from there. Yeah, ideally. And you can do that by just, you know, loading up a certain weight and trying to get more more reps or slowly upping the weight. Uh, but you must always get feedback from the rest of your training. So starting super high and saying, okay, medium dose will do, will still do, you know, 12 sets per week or, you know, six sets per week or whatever. And then seeing at week two that, okay, now I am unable to move because I've also done a bunch of triathlon training on top of it, um, I think doesn't make as much sense as, okay, I'll start slow. We know that mm. even if it's less than you need to meaningfully increase, you're still maintaining strength. So there's not really a huge downside. And after a couple of weeks, you'll be able to adjust that and take it from there and continue adjusting. It was quite an interesting point you said regarding maybe have the upper body volume when it comes to strength training a little bit higher because if you think about what the lower body is doing, especially for a triathlon, you've got all the running and the cycling, so they're doing a lot there. There's going to be a lot of fatigue associated with that, so you can't probably do as much lower body stuff as you were originally doing if you're just focusing on the powerlifting. And I noticed one of your Instagram posts recently where you talk about, I think it's a two three one split so it's like two squat sessions three bench sessions and one deadlift um is that following a similar vein uh, is it because that splits it three upper body three lower body or is it that the upper body just seems to respond a little bit differently to strength training in comparison to the lower body um, so this was this was based so th this this was the squat bench and deadlift uh Training weekly training frequency that we used for the studies uh, for all the, the papers that I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, and it was it was built this way because anecdotally and from my coaching experience and in powerlifting, the bench usually requires a bit more work to move than the squat and the deadlift. With the deadlift, again, usually requiring less than the squat, but that's in terms of conditions apply. That's not like a, a set in stone uh, fact. So that was the purpose there. Um, it, it wasn't so much that it, I didn't, we didn't think of it as upper body, we thought of it as bench, but yeah, it does represent uh, the upper body. But in the triathlon example, I think that, you know, having a few extra sets of chin ups or uh, being able to do a bit more bench pressing, as long as you're monitoring your triathlon training, it, it, it is a safer bet than saying, all right, I'll just keep adding squats and deadlifts, mm. if that makes sense. So in, in that way, you can minimum dose, like you can go absolute minimum dose for some exercises. So you do your one set of deadlifts per week and your two sets of squats per week um, so that you maintain, you know, your, your leg musculature and your strength on those exercises. But at the same time, you may find that, hey, doing a few more bicep curls because you enjoy doing them and doing a few more lat pull downs is not really taking much away from your uh, from your training. Again, depends on the level, depends on the feedback that you're getting. If you're a serious triathlete competing at the highest level, uh, you may have to be even more strict with the stuff that you keep in there. Mm. Yeah. Regarding, because now we've gone straight into like the triathlon and the strength training example, I, I wanted to touch on your other research area, which you looked at um, uh, aerobic training and how that can affect strength development in in powerlifters isn't that right uh and powerlifters what, and strongman yeah why would aerobic training benefit uh powerlifters and strongmen 
Um, there's a there's a great uh, article, Stronger by Science. I think if you if you Google, so that's that's reading material for the, the crowd. Mm. The crowd. The yeah, I'll put everything in the show notes. Definitely. The fan base. Um, and if you Google <laughs> cardio for lifters, Stronger by Science, I think you should you should get it. But in general, unless you are uh, you know in competition preparation and you are you know, competing at the highest level and you're like a few weeks out, uh, including some sort of uh, cardio um, exercise if, as a power lifter is important for, for the following reasons. Reason number one, health. Uh, if you're, you know, again, I understand that if you're competing at the highest level possible and you're a super heavyweight and doing any sort of cardio will, will take away from your training, you, you know, the highest level of competition comes with some sacrifice. But for most people, uh, going for a walk or, you know, for a jog, if that's their thing, or doing some sort of recreational uh, sport um, and, and staying uh, cardiovascularly healthy will allow them to potentially recover better, uh, thus perform better and have better longevity uh, in strength training, e- even if they're not powerlifters. The, o- the other reason is that if you're... Um, I'm not sure if uh, I'm trying to find the scientific term, but uh, like if you're not, if you're very unfit, um, I was I was uh, I was thinking of something else to say. But if you're very unfit, uh, being able to recover b- between sessions and maybe within sessions might become an issue, especially when you're doing higher volume work. So if you do sets of five to eight repetitions or eight to twelve, and you're getting absolutely gassed out because you you know you'll be doing them on. Uh, multi-joint exercises like the squat, the, ba- the, the bench, the deadlift, you know, exercises that may be a bit more demanding. If you're absolutely unfit, there's a high chance that you'll probably be able to do less overall work. Now, that, that doesn't mean that you need to become a marathon runner, um, but uh, keeping fit and uh, including some cardio in your overall uh, training program, uh, preferably away from your uh, strength training sessions, um, I think would will, will benefit most lifters uh, for those those two reasons. Uh, but again, happy medium. I personally uh, enjoy walking and I cycle to the gym a few times per week, uh, so that covers me. Uh, I'd say for for most lifters, um, from a from a health perspective, if they are doing you know ten to twelve eight to twelve thousand steps a day and some sort of uh, aerobic fitness activity a couple of times per week, that should cover their base. Um, but yeah. Mm. And, and, and in your research, you found that the additional sort of high intensity interval training, either by cycling or by utilizing some kind of, I guess, in weight training circuit type thing, didn't actually have a negative effect on the development of strength. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And it, it's just... Uh, minor, minor note. Well, not minor. Uh, one limitation was that because we didn't control for the training of the participants, so for their mm-hmm. own training, we didn't really, you know, um, they they were doing whatever they were doing. But it, it seems like adding some high intensity interval training on top of that in in uh, strength athletes that weren't, you know, going through some intense weight loss phase or um, and adding a bit of uh, high intensity interval training on top of their usual training did not impact uh, their training, and that's uh, that's I think something we've we've uh, we've seen a lot in the past years as high intensity interval training has become more and more um, of a of a thing. Well, it went through the typical phase of everything, new thing, craze, normal thing. Yeah. <laughs> And I guess uh, even though you said there's limitations with that particular study, it still carries like a good message around that if you you can still add some form of aerobic capacity training, it's not necessarily going to reduce the uh, development of strength. However, if you make sure that you program the aerobic capacity training you do correctly on top of correctly programming for strength, the two could easily be done simultaneously. Yes, for sure. And again, it comes back down to, hey, if you see that doing high intensity interval training cycling gets your quads extremely sore and you or it hurts your knee, potentially switch to something else, you know, try the elliptical machine or do some swimming or uh, do some incline walking or whatever. Uh, But yeah, it comes back down to 
see what mod modality works for you. We've seen that different uh, aerobic modalities, even using weights as an uh, aerobic modality, uh, using weight training to, to improve your cardio can, can potentially work. Um, so see what you enjoy most, what um, fits your the rest of your training well. Don't start at the high end. Start start mm -hmm. slow. Start low and, and add as you as you feel necessary. Um, and s try and separate your uh, aerobic training from your uh, weight training. So I ideally either do them on a separate day or separate them by a good few hours. Ideally. Now, if you did it right afterwards, again, if you're not world champion powerlifter getting ready for his con, um, I'm not sure whether that would be, you know, the end of your strength gains. I'm, I'm sure it wouldn't be the end, uh, the end of this, your strength gains. Uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Pac, that was absolutely brilliant and really strong messages at the end, especially towards the theme of this of this whole season of the progress theory about being able to train strength and endurance simultaneously. So thank you so much for that. And I've definitely got a few ideas for my own programming that I'm definitely going to start implementing and testing out. Um, where can the listeners find you on Instagram? Um, so my Instagram handle is Dr. Dr. Double underscore pack P A K. But if they write pack and they're following you, it may just come up. Uh, and I'm on Twitter. Well, my Twitter Twitter life is less active than uh, than Instagram. And they can just write PAC, P-A-K, and then Patroclos, P-A-T-R-O-K-L-O-S as one as one word. And that's, uh, that's my more academic sort of uh, side. Yeah. And the Stronger by Science, definitely everyone check that out. Yeah, if you're after uh, strongerbyscience.com, uh, even before I started, um, as a coach there, it was one of my go-to resources that I always told students to, to use uh, a lot of amazing content uh, and incredible podcast as well. Sorry to, to promote the competition no, here. Promote all you want. I want to, I want to, you know, get the good resources out there for everyone to listen to. So, and they also offer again no conflict of interest there. I'm not, I don't get any. I have no financial benefit from 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 saying that. They have a research review called Mass Monthly Applications in uh, Strength Sport, where what they do is it's uh, Dr. Helms, Dr. Trexler, Dr. Zurdos, and uh, Greg Knuckles, and they take um, uh, studies that are relevant to people who lift, uh, nutritional and uh, training studies, and they uh, essentially summarize them every month in a very nicely presented and easy to read issue, including their own interpretation and practical applications for everybody's training. So they do have that service too, which if um, you want to stay on top of the latest research without having to do your PubMed scan every, mm. every month, uh, that's a very efficient way to do so. Yeah, that I should be getting awesome. paid for the, the promo. No? It was, that was a nice promo. <laughs> yeah, it was very well done. I'll send a clip of that so you can use it as a bit of advertising and uh, say that you'll only give it to them if uh, you get some cash for it. Cash. No, thank you for <laughs> having me. I really, really enjoy that. I, my pleasure. Oh, and Siri, Siri was happy to have me as well. So it's my <laughs> Siri just replied, my pleasure. Um, and yeah. Yeah, thanks. Not and I, I, I apologize for the verbal diarrhea at, at certain, certain stages it was just a lot of information that i wanted to to pack in and i know that you know, no that was numbers perfect. And study one and three yeah no it was perfect really well thought out and some real clear messages that i think everyone that's listening can really implement into their own training but thank you so much i'll have to come down to southampton sometime and we'll go for a lifting session yes you're always welcome to come join us here at the pride of the south <laughs> pride of the south <laughs> Brilliant. I will do. Cool. Cheers, Pat. Thank you.